Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we are doing a deck tech for Vihan Goldwaker. Vihan is a Mardu 3-3 for 3. He says other outlaws you control have vigilance and haste. Outlaws are just assassins, mercenaries, pirates, rogues, and warlocks. And then at the beginning of combat on your turn, you may have treasures you control become 3-3 construct assassin artifact creatures in addition to their other types. And since they're constructs, they're assassins, they get vigilance and haste. This is treasure aristocrats. Why play Vihan? Three mana um, to give all your guys Vigilance and Haste is a great rate. We're not really running, I don't think, a ton of non-outlaws. I mean, maybe 50-50. But either way, we only care about the treasures having Haste. And also, making our easily generated mana rocks into quote-unquote mana rocks into 3-3s three is huge to beat down our opponents. And Haste lets our treasures attack right away if we make them on that turn before combat. And Vigilance lets us tap and sacrifice them post-combat or even during combat for combat tricks. Here's the game plan. We need Vihan to win. Uh, we really just need his body. We just need all of them to close out the game. So early game, we're going to want to play Aristocrats and Treasure Production. Mid game, we're going to want to play Vihan and then attack with our treasures. And then late game, uh, really post combat, we're going to want to sacrifice our treasures to themselves just so we can use our Aristocrats to kill our opponents and then also just have more mana to do more things um, with our treasures. So. <laughs> Get a lot of mana, make a lot of guys, uh, deal a lot of damage, sacrifice them all. Here are the vulnerabilities. Um, it's awkward to pick, but it's really artifact hate and uh, some stacks effects. So Stony Silence says activated abilities of artifacts can't be activated. That means we can't sacrifice our treasure, which is very awkward. Um, and then Lavinia Azorius Renegade is a stacks effect that bothers us quite a bit. Um, each opponent can't cast non-creature spells with CMC um, greater than the number of lands we control. Uh, we're kind of heavily reliant on treasures. For We don't have a ton of ramp. We don't have a ton of... We don't really... I think we have maybe one ramp spell other than treasure generation. We really rely on treasure generation, so cards like that can really pin us down. Channel and deck stuff. Uh, the deck costs like 620 bucks. The deck's expensive. Really, there's like five cards that make the deck this expensive. So if you cut them, you'll know when you you'll know when you see them in the video. Um, but get those cards you need from the link down below. Helps me out. Helps the channel grow. And then like, comment, and subscribe. That also really helps a lot more than you guys might think. Um, anyway, getting to the bulk of it. Academy manufacturer. If you would create a clue, food, or treasure, instead make one of each. Since we're always making treasure, all of our treasures are just going to come with an extra food and a clue, which is nice. Ancient Copper Dragon, when it deals combat damage to a player, roll a d20, you create a number of treasure tokens equal to the result. So we're not trying to whip out Vihan immediately. We kind of want to get a lot of treasures because they're all going to be three threes. Um, so it's okay to like have a bit slower cards like Ancient Copper Dragon. Because uh, even if Ancient Copper Dragon even makes like attacks and then makes like five treasure... For example, we roll a 5 on a d20. It's like, well, next turn we can play um, Vihan and then just we now have five 3-3s three and still Ancient Copper Dragon to attack. Um, and again, we have so much treasure generation in the deck. Six mana seems like a lot, but it's not that bad. Um, Blood Artist, whenever it or another creature dies, target player loses one life and we gain one life. It just so happens that our uh, treasures turn into uh, guys. They turn into creatures. So when we go post-combat, and we have cards like Blood Artist on the field, and we want to cast spells post-combat, we're just sacrificing our treasure to themselves. So Blood Artist and all our Aristocrat pieces are just going to ping everyone and drain them and deal damage. Um, we're going to gain a bunch of life, and then we're just going to do what we want to do with those treasures anyways. Captain Lannery Storm is a haste 2-2, and when it attacks, make a treasure. And then when you sacrifice a treasure, she gets plus 1, plus 0 until end of turn. So she could potentially be lethal if she goes unblocked, if we just decide to sacrifice our board, um, assuming like we don't reanimate them or animate them that turn with Vihan. Or just really making a treasure on attack is not bad. That treasure isn't going to be able to attack right away, but it's still an untapped treasure. Crime Novelist is really good, because whenever you sacrifice an artifact, you put a 1-1 counter on them, and then you add a red. So really, it makes all of our treasures when we sacrifice them, regardless if they're creatures or not, um tap for any color plus an additional red and it makes this guy a little bit bigger 
Cruel Celebrant, just another great um, aristocrat pre piece. Whenever it dies or another creature or planeswalker you control dies, each opponent loses one life and we gain one life. Cruel Celebrant is good over Blood Artist. Blood Artist hits, oh, it, it's different, but for aristocrat pieces on for our deck, hitting each opponent rather than just one is really big. Dockside Extortionist, when he enters the battlefield, create X treasures, where X is the total number of artifacts and enchantments your opponents control. He's notorious. He is so insanely good, and particularly for this deck, he makes so much treasure. Like, even, like, if if we play him and we make five treasure, that's basically two mana for 15 power. It's great. Um, Elias Hill Core Sadistic Pilgrim, just a 2-2 two, two for two with Death Touch. Um, whenever a creature enters, we gain a life. Whenever a creature dies, each opponent loses a life. Uh, we're not really worried about the life game part of this. We really just care about the death. That's the aristocrat piece. Uh, Generous Plunder is a new card from the big score. He's a two mana, 2-2 two, two with Menace. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may create a, cre a treasure token. When you do, target opponent creates a tapped treasure token. And then whenever he attacks, it deals damage to the defending player equal to the total number of artifacts they control. It's not great to ramp our opponents, um, but at least it is kind of like a Punisher piece. Like It helps us out just because we get the extra treasure and it's awkward. We don't want to give our opponents mana, but it just does a little bit extra damage. And then we have just more mana to deal with later. Goldspan Dragon. Um, when he attacks or becomes the target of a spell, make treasure. And treasures uh, basically double up. They tap for two mana of any one color now. Um, which is really good because we're a treasure deck. Um, so he makes a lot of treasure. And the cool thing is if you try to kill him, uh, we make a treasure. Which is good. Grim Hireling, whenever one or more creatures you can shield deal damage to a player, create two treasure tokens. That's pretty good. Then we can pay one sacrifice X treasure to essentially kill a creature. So we just give a creature minus X minus. It's it's removal. We want to use like we want to use all the treasure we can. Illustrious Wanderglyph. Ascend the whole, you know, gets City's Blessing. Other artifact creatures you control get plus two plus two if you have the City's Blessing. And then at the beginning of uh, each upkeep, you make a one one gnome. So we get a lot of treasure pretty quick. Um all of our treasures are three threes. They are now five fives. Also, on every upkeep, he makes a free three three, which is good. Um, it's really just to help us with our. Um, it makes our guys bigger, and it helps us build a board presence when we don't have, like when we're not ready to win yet, like when we don't have enough treasure to make swinging out worthwhile for a combat trick or whatever. Uh, Jan Jansen, Chaos Crafter, haste, a sacrifice an artifact, create two treasures. An artifact creature make two treasures. Post combat, we sacrifice our treasure token to make two treasures for next turn, or we sacrifice a non-creature artifact, which is just a non-animated treasure, to then make two one-one guys. He kind of cycles in between himself. He's really good. Um, combo profiteering mayor, brand new card um, from Thunder Junction. Whenever one or more tokens enter the battlefield under your opponent's control, for each of them, create a tapped token that is a copy of it. The ability only triggers once per turn, and then whenever one or more tokens enter the battlefield under your control, each opponent loses one life and we gain a life. The top ability isn't crazy. It's hard to analyze in a nutshell, but I mean, assuming our opponents are like making a treasure, which is probably the most common token in Magic, or even just they're making a 1-1 one -one guy token, we'll take a copy of it, why not? And then whenever we have our tokens enter, all of our treasures, um, each opponent loses a life and we gain a life. Not per treasure, which is important because it's whenever one or more. Jan Jansen, even though he creates two treasures, um, since it's one or more, we're only he only does it per effect that makes treasure rather than um, the total amount. But it's still really good regardless. Uh, we have Kellogg Dangerous Mind. He's a three mana, three two first strike haste from Fallout. He's a mercenary. He's a whatever outlaw. When he attacks, make a treasure. He's annoying to block because he has or he has first strike. And then we can sacrifice five treasures to gain control of a creature for as long as we control Kellogg. We can only do it as a sorcery, which sucks. But, I mean, even just attacking and making a treasure is big setup for later. Lotho, Corrupt Sheriff, Lotho, Lotho, whatever. Whenever a player casts their second spell each turn, we lose a life and we make a treasure. I'd say most people are playing more than one spell a turn in Magic. So, the idea is on each opponent's turn, we make a treasure and lose a life. Uh, the life loss is scary, but since we have so many other aristocrat pieces, it hardly matters. We have so much life gain. Magda Bray's an outlaw. Um, funny enough, isn't an outlaw. Just isn't. 
Um, but other dwarves get plus one, plus one. Whenever a dwarf you control becomes tapped, create a treasure. Magda's a dwarf, um, so she enables them herself. And then we can sacrifice five treasures to search a library for an artifact card or a dragon card and put it onto the battlefield. Um, it's good. It's really just, you can read Magda as when it attacks, make a treasure. Um, and then when we sacrifice five treasures, we're probably just going to get Ancient Copper Dragon or Goldspan Dragon, which is still pretty good. Uh, and then we have new Magda Horde Master. Um, whenever you commit a crime, create a tapped treasure token. Only triggers once per turn. Blood, Art Blood Artist is like a good example of committing a crime because it targets a player with uh, like life loss. Um, and then we can sacrifice three treasures to make a 4-4 four, four, uh, red scorpion dragon with flying and haste. We can only do it as a sorcery, but I mean, if we're not, like again, the deck is cool because we can change our plan depending on what the board state's looking like. If our opponent has too much stuff going on, we don't have to animate all our creatures. We can just like go passive and make four fours or search our deck for a dragon and then see what happens. Um, we don't have to just like instantly swing out and win, try like win like that. We, we get options. Mahadi Emporium Master. At the beginning of your end step, create a treasure token for each creature that died this turn. I like this card with our commander because we do a big swing. Um, and then whatever connects, connects. Great. Whatever dies, dies. That's fine. Triggers our aristocrats. And then we kind of get all of our treasures back, essentially, because they're all died, quote unquote. If they're creatures, if we sacrifice them for mana, they died to combat damage, whatever. We get them all back. Mary the Killing Quill, Vampire Assassin. Whenever a creature an opponent control dies, exile it with a hit counter on it. And then Assassins, Mercenary, and Rogues you control have the Death Touch. It gives our treasures Death Touch because they're Assassins. And whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, you may remove a hit counter from that card. That player earns an exile. If you do, draw a card and create two treasure tokens. Really good. Um, it's basically the logic behind the card is its Grave Hate. Um, so basically it kind of stops reanimation effects from like going on and on if someone's playing like a reanimator. Um, it also makes our guys annoying to block just because now they have death touch. So like people aren't just going to like, they're either just going to trade with a creature, kill a creature or connect, which is then going to draw us a card and make two treasures, which is just six more power for next turn. Marionette master is a way we can kind of just kill people. Six mana for a one three. Fabricate three. So fabricate is when a creature enter when this creature enters, you can either put uh X counters on it where X is the fabricate cost, or you make that many one one guys. Uh, for Marionette Master, we're going to put the three counters right on it. So then it's going to be a four six. And then whenever an artifact you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, target opponent loses life equal to Marionette's master's power. Which basically reads um whenever we sack a treasure, target player loses four life. Which is good. <laughs> Mastermind Plum, when he attacks, exile up to one target card from Graveyard. If an artifact card was exiled this way, create a treasure token. Um, just treasure generation and Graveyard hate, whatever. And then whenever you cast a spell, if mana from a treasure was spent to cast it, we draw a card and lose a life. So we rely on our treasures pretty heavily. Like they are, we want to use our lands, um, but even just having a treasure like used to cast a spell and then we just draw a card off of it is pretty good. And again... If they're creatures, we trigger our aristocrat pieces. Mayhem Devil is whenever a player sacrifices a permanent, it deals one damage to any target. This is huge, right? One, it triggers all of our commit crime effects. And it's also whenever a player, not just us, a player sacrifices a permanent, deals one damage to any target. So in a vacuum, right? Our treasure sacrifice to deal one damage to any target that kills creatures, it deals damage directly to player, it kills planeswalkers, it's good. Um, then we can look on it on a broader space. Whenever our opponent sacrifices treasure or an opponent cracks a fetch land or our opponent does whatever, right? We now get to ping him for it. Mirkwood Bats. Uh, whenever you create or sacrifice a token, each opponent loses one life. Uh, kind of insane for treasure because we make a treasure. Each opponent loses a life. Um, we sacrifice that treasure for mana. Each opponent loses a life. Really, really good. Mondract Glory Dominus, if one or more tokens would be created under your control, create twice that many of those tokens um, instead, which is good. It doubles up all of our tokens, all of our treasure generation. And then uh, we can just pay one mana and four life because Phyrexian mana never really pay the cost unless you're dead. 
Um, one mana, four life, sacrifice two other artifacts and or creatures to put an indestructible counter on Mondrak. This thing's not going anywhere. You got to kill it with an exile spell. Uh, we have Nadir Nightblade. Whenever a token you control leaves the battlefield, each opponent loses one life and you gain a life. Again, whenever we sacrifice a treasure, drain. Um, Olivia, who is actually the face commander, uh, but I decided that um, this dwarf is better. You know, I just think he's better. Um, so Olivia is a flying lifelink. Whenever one or more outlaws you control deal combat damage to a player, create a treasure token. Our assassins, they're construct assassins, so we make a treasure. Uh, per player that was hit and then we can pay three mana to sacrifice two treasure to put a one one counter on each creature you control we can only do it as a sorcery it's awkward right um so in a vacuum we have three opponents we each hit an opponent with a treasure we make one more treasure and then i guess while they're animated we can pay three mana sacrifice some of the treasures we just made um to put two one one counters on each treasure so in a way if we want to beef up our tokens like we can for sure put two one one counters on our treasure tokens and all of our other creatures uh it's awkward but i mean we get a good amount of just non-treasure creature stuff a lot of our creatures want to make treasure and they care about it but olivia is still good because it beefs up all of our other guys too so it's a uh, almost like a backup plan Pitiless Plunder, whenever another creature you control dies, make a treasure. It's not infinite. It, I, I know it looks infinite with the treasure because it's like, oh, well, I have a treasure and then I sacrifice my treasure and then I get another treasure. It's like, well, it only works if that treasure is a creature and those treasures are only animated on combat. So you kind of get a, a freebie and then everything else doesn't really happen. But it's really good just because our they replace themselves when they're creatures, which is really good. So we kind of get all of our aristocrat abilities for free. And then we just get the untapped treasure, which is good. Um, professional face breaker. Whenever one or more creatures deal combat damage to a player, make a treasure. Great. It's menace. Great. And then we can sacrifice a treasure to exile the top card of our library. And then we can play that card this turn. So if we don't have much going on, if we don't have any like card draw or we're hellbent or whatever, we can just sacrifice our treasure to effectively draw a card. Uh, Prosper Tonebound, I was iffy about adding it to the deck. He is 4 mana 1 4 death touch, very annoying to attack into. At the beginning of your end step, exile the top card of your library. You may play that until your next turn. Um, and then whenever you play a card from exile, create a treasure. So Prosper enables himself, right? Just in the vacuum, he works with himself. And then we have some other cards like Professional Facebreaker is a good example um, where we can exile cards and play them. Um, he's not as fast as you might think, but I think he's worthwhile to add to the deck just because I, I, the way I read him is at the beginning of your end step, basically draw a card. And then when you cast that card, make a treasure. I think that's fine. And he just has upside. Then we have reckless fire weaver. Whenever an artifact enters the battlefield under our control deals one damage to an opponent. Uh, we have a lot of artifacts enter because they're treasures. So that's a lot of damage to each of our opponents. Uh, ruthless technomancer. 4 mana 2 4. When he enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice another creature. If you do, create a number of treasures equal to that creature to that creature's power. Then pay 3 mana, sacrifice X artifacts to return target creature card with power X or less from our graveyard to the battlefield, right? Here's how I look at this guy. I think he's super cool. So, when he enters the battlefield, we're going to sacrifice a treasure that is a creature. So, we sacrifice that creature, we get 3 treasures. For that treasure so lose one treasure make three treasures sound good pay three mana sacrifice whatever we reanimate our aristocrat pieces like reckless fireweaver or whatever so they're not truly gone zorn if you would create one or more treasure tokens instead create that many plus one additional so all of our effects that just make a treasure token like captain lannery storm or even pitiless plunder it's like well now we're getting an extra so we don't he almost doubles up our treasure generation and then finally, Zulaport Cutthroat. Whenever it or another creature you control dies, each opponent loses one. We gain one. An excellent aristocrat piece. Going into sorceries, Blasphemous Act. Here's why I really like Blasphemous Act. Um, because if we don't have any creatures, or very realistically what we could do, right, is play Blasphemous Act for whatever the cost is, right? Assuming we have a good amount of treasure. Wipe our opponent's field. Play our commander for three. 
reanimate all of our treasures. No one has a board to block all of our hasty 3-3s. Three Huge. Blood Money is just a good nuke. 7 mana. Destroy all creatures for each non-token creature destroyed this way. We make a treasure. Helps us out for the next turn. Brass's Bounty. 7 mana is steep. And then for each land you control, create a colorless treasure artifact token with tap it, sacrifice the artifact. Add 1 mana of any color to your mana pool. So it's just kind of if we have a lot of mana late game, or even if we have like token doublers or big effects like that, like Mondrak or whatever, we can net positive on this generally, um, which I think is good. And we're probably not going to be casting it uh, if not like so in my head, it's it's good setup for later. It's real. It's a really weird ritual, but I think it's still fine. Diabolic intent, sacrifice a creature, search your deck for a card, put it into your hand, sacrifice a treasure token. Uh, or treasure token creature or whatever um have all of the aristocrat abilities trigger and then we uh get whatever we want works out hell to pay deals x damage to target creature and then create a number of tapped treasure tokens equal to the excess damage dealt this way it's just a good removal spell in my opinion honestly um ruinous ultimatum it's just a good nuke destroy it wipes our opponent's field and then we can crash in the mana cost is seven and it's a really awkward mana cost but when our treasures tap for any color it's pretty easy to cast seize the spotlight's very interesting for each opponent uh they choose fame or fortune for each player who chooses fame we steal one of their creatures until end of turn uh and they get haste and then for each player who chooses fortune draw a card and create a treasure token um which is good you know so it's either we steal one of their creatures um so then they can't block super well and we get to deal damage with it um we really take their best creature or we draw a card and make a treasure so worst case like worst case right everyone chooses fame we steal their best creatures we swing that's good deal a lot of damage to someone um or we make everyone says uh fortune we get three treasures and draw three cards so effectively we paid no mana to draw three cards good torment of hellfire is just a big x spell we can just dump out really um assuming it doesn't get countered it's probably game over for our opponents because we have so much treasure generation we can just be like ah 10 uh lose 30 or sacrifice a lot of guys or discard like your whole hand like really see what you can do if you can live um, and generally, big torments of Hailfire uh, are tough to live through. Uh, Toxic Deluge, as an additional cost pay X life, we gain a lot of life for Aristocrats. It's fine. All creatures get minus X, minus X until end of turn. Uh, card is the same way as Blasphemous Act. I look at it as uh, you just play it before combat, and then we play our commander, and then we animate all of our tokens, and then that's it. We have clear board. Going into instance, we can cast these during combat, which I like, right? So what we can do is, if you control our commander, we're going to, because we need him to win effectively. We, I guess maybe we don't need him to win, but we really need him to go nuts, right? We cast this before blocks, right? Or if someone doesn't block and we're just like, oh, you know, all of our guys are double strike and vigilant until end of turn and flying. Or lifelink indestructible pro creatures so it's really good it's it's essentially a kill spell basically that's how i look at this card of as well if you have enough creatures destroy his target player anguish done making um is good in response to awkward blocks right so exile target and on land we lose three who cares uh so since we can just they have vigilance we can tap them and sacrifice them in combat so if one of our treasures is going to die we can just whip out an instant and it's fine right uh, because it's blocked anyway, it's going to die, and now we can do mana stuff at instant speed. Uh, like big score, additional cost, discard a card, uh, draw two cards, create two treasure tokens, right? Like assume you swing with a 3-3 three, three treasure and it gets blocked by like a 5-5. Five, five. You know, it's going to be gone anyway, so you might as well tap it and sacrifice it um, to draw two cards and make treasure tokens. Also, if they block it with a lifelink creature, just get rid of it so they don't gain the life, and then we cast an instant. So yeah, drawing two cards and making two treasures for next turn, real good. Bottle Cat Blast, it has Improvise. Your artifacts can help this, basically help you cast it um, by tapping it. 
not tapping and sacrificing it by tapping it. So we can pay effectively one mana and tap, but not sacrifice four treasure tokens to deal five damage to uh, any target. And then any excess damage, we just make that many tapped treasures. So it's pretty good. I mean, honestly, just looking at it like worst case scenario, you're like, okay, um, on someone's end step before our turn, we're just going to deal five damage to like a one, one, uh, and then we'll make, you know, four treasures. And now we have effectively 12 power to attack with on our turn. Uh, deadly dispute again, do it whenever, do it in a weird block, do it. If you need it, draw two cards, create a treasure card, draw treasure generation. That's what we like in the deck. Great train heist, I think can honestly just kill someone, uh, depending on what we want to do with it, right? So I imagine we cast this in response to awkward blocks, right? We sacrifice everything that was blocked and we do the best we can. Untap all creatures you control. There's an additional combat step. Creatures you control get plus one, plus oh, and get first strike. And then choose target opponent whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player. Uh, make a tapped treasure token. Those tapped treasures can't attack. Uh, but they're still good because we can get multiple combats for, you know, our treasures, which we kind of want to use anyways, which is good. Stroke of Midnight, it's just good removal to start target non lane. It's actually starting to be one of my preferred removal spells over like Generous Gift, just because you very rarely need to pop lands and a 1-1 one -one is significantly better for our opponent to have than a 3-3. Three -three. I think it's fine. Swords to Plowshares, it's just good, easy removal. Uh, you know, whatever amount of life they gain, we're just going to beat down anyways. Um, unexpected Windfall, draw two guards, create two treasure tokens at instant speed. Again, in response to weird blocks, we just filter it out. Going into artifacts, we don't have a ton, right? Arcane Signet is one of our only ramp pieces. Lightning Greaves is just to put on a hasty, just basically, if we want a creature to be haste, hasty, right? I know our commander gives creatures haste and vigilance anyway, but there are some cards that aren't. Right? So if we're like, oh, you know, we just want to play like an ancient copper dragon and we want to attack with it. It's like, well, now we can. Skull Clamp is good if things are awkward and we have nothing to do. If like we like use all our cards in our hand, we can animate our guys, put Skull Clamp on our guy, like a treasure, and then sacrifice the treasure for a mana and then draw two cards off of it. So it's not too bad. And then it's soaring because it's soaring. It's this fast mana that's on a budget. Aggravated Assault, untap, this, untap all creatures you control. There's an additional combat phase followed by a main phase. Sounds good to me. Five mana is not that bad. And we, again, like if we have like an ancient brass dragon or whatever, that could potentially be infinite. Just could be infinite, you know, infinite combats. Um, and since, yeah, whatever, it's infinite combats. Anointed Procession uh, doubles up our token generation. Black Market Connections is just good. The life loss isn't that big of a deal. But we make a treasure. I feel like every turn for three mana, we're just going to make a treasure, draw a card, and lose three life. You know, we get an extra mana on our turn, and we draw an extra card. That's not bad. I like it. We can make a 3-3 three, three if you want. That's still fine. Descent into Avernus. At the beginning of your upkeep, put two Descent counters on it. Then each player creates X treasure tokens, and it deals X damage to each player where X is the number of Descent counters on it. So it's cool, because on our turn, those two treasures are now 6-6s. Six or sorry, four or three threes. So that's six damage, six power. And then we get four treasures. It helps our opponents, but I think it helps us even more. And it also hits them down. Reign of Riches, when it enters the battlefield, make two treasures. So it really only costs three mana, the way you can look at it. And then the first spell you cast each turn that had mana from a treasure to cast it has Cascade. So it's an extra free spell. Sounds good. Revel in Riches is a funny, just win the game kind of card. Whenever an opponent uh whenever a creature in opponent control dies we'll make a treasure and then if we have 10 or more treasures on our upkeep we just win uh that's a pretty realistic way to win uh, it's gonna worst case eat a kill spell which is fine smothering type uh whenever an opponent draws a card if they don't pay two effectively we make a three three sounds good to me um and then spiteful banditry is red red x when it enters the battlefield it deals x damage to each creature and then whenever more creatures your opponent's control die you make a treasure and it only triggers once each turn right so here's how i look at it uh let's say x is three we pay five mana to um kill all creatures we make a treasure off of it and then it just sticks around so whenever an opponent basically once per turn we're probably making a treasure because we're not the only ones being attacked if someone sacrifices a token if someone just jumps with whatever and it dies we're just passively getting treasure and it's a pseudo board wipe 
going into lands, we just have the shock lands, we have the check lands, we have the vow cycle, haunted lands, whatever you want to call them. Uh, we have the battle bond lands. We and then for regular, you know, specific fun lands, command beacon. Just we don't want our commander to cost that much. So if he just keeps dying over and over again, we can just get him back one extra time for three mana and then cheese him in and see if we can win real quick. Command tower because it's going to tap for any color. And Venner's Fair, at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control three or more artifacts, gain a life. We probably will. Taps for a colorless. And then in a pinch, we can sacrifice it and search our deck for an artifact card. Our artifact cards are literally that we would take are Lightning Greaves and um, Skull Clamp. So if we really want a hasty guy or we need protection or we just want to draw cards, we can crack in Venner's Fair. Other than that, no real use for it. Mines of Moira, when enters the battlefield tap, unless you control a legendary creature. And we can instant speed exile three cards from our graveyard to make two treasure tokens. Um, we don't really care about our graveyard. We're not getting anything back unless it's like with Technomancer. So get what, but get back what makes sense. And then treasure vault, we can just instant speed someone's end step, sacrifice treasure vault, make a bunch of treasures. I like it. And then we just on our turn, we have all those treasures and we can just swing out. Going into lands, we got 666, um, 18 lands. We don't really care too much about our lands because we just make so much treasure. You know, we have 35 lands, but we just make so much treasure, it hardly matters. Uh, so our basics are fine. Honestly, guys, that's it. Thank you guys for watching. Get the cards you need from the link below. Support the channel in any way you'd like. Thank you guys so much, and I'll see you next time.